Thank you so much. I'm, I'm honored, and I, I was almost in tears when you all stood up to honor me. I was in tears. You know, thank you. Uh, I mean, today, it was an amazing time. Thank you, James. As you led in worship, you know, some of the words are still ringing in my, in my ears. You know, especially that one which says, heaven beckons me. And I, and I trust that as I bring the word today, that you will hear the voice of God, that heaven will beckon you, that you will hear the call of God upon your life, call to ministry, call to mission, call to serve God, but call to do great things for God. And Audrey and my, my wife Pixie, my lovely wife Pixie who brought the word encouragement, thank you. But Audrey, you spoke about, you know, about Jesus coming on, on a donkey, on a colt. And as a young boy, I always wondered why did Jesus come on a donkey? You know, but then as I, later on, as I learned, when a person comes on a donkey, they come on in peace. You know, normally when people enter, enter a, a place, the generals or the kings, they would come on a horse. Why? They would come to conquer that place and they come in power. But Jesus came on a donkey. In other words, he came in peace. The first time, he came in peace. But the second time, when we see in Revelation, he does not come on a donkey. He comes riding on a white horse. I, yeah. And I just pray that we are ready to receive him at that time, when God prepares our hearts. So, we are continuing on the book of Ezra, chapter 8. Last week, uh, Kingsley brought an amazing word. He spoke, Kingsford spoke about God of the second chance. I just love that phrase, God of the second chance. Because each time we're reminded of God of the second chance, it always takes me back to the book of Jonah. Why? Because there it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. And we think of, yeah, God of the second chance. But in Ezra also, God comes the second time to the people who were in captivity. Kingsford spoke about God's faithfulness and throughout the chapter, the book, we see God's faithfulness to restore people back to the land, rest restore a destroyed temple, and re restore worship, and leave a legacy. And that's what I want to speak on, leaving a legacy. So today I want to speak on four points. One, families committed to the kingdom advancement. Second, no Levites, which is a sad statement. Third, Ezra's trust in God. And fourth, talents and treasures. I'm not going to read through the first 14 verses. And that's the reason why. Some of the names even I can't pronounce myself. But always, when you see a long list of names, you got to remember the author has written it for a purpose. And like a miner, you got to mine to see what is the truth, what is the principle that he's trying to explain. And let's see if, if I can do that. But I'll read verse 1, which will help us to understand. It says, these are the family heads and those registered with them who came up with me from Babylon during the reign of King Artaxerxes. So they were the family heads uh, from, if, if you add up the list of people that Ezra's writing about, total there are about 1,500 men. And this is besides the women and the children. Next, we learn that 11 of the 13 families are mentioned in, the ch in Ezra chapter 2. So 11 families from Ezra chapter 8 are mentioned in Ezra chapter 2 as well. What does this tell us? Dave Davis says, covenant fidelity tends to run in families. What does that mean? When one person of the family moves to another country, it inspires something in the next person, whether in the immediate family or in the extended family. It inspires something. You know, They want to go on the adventure themselves. But we see it very much in, in, in our city itself. One person comes from their country, then 
another family member comes or extended family comes and that's how it happens and then they have a small you know family unit in that city and that's exactly what was happening Ezra knew that the hand of God was upon him and every reference in the bible to the hand of God was the presence of God yeah each time we find the hand of God came upon me we find God was about to move and God was about to do something when Ezra knew the hand of God was upon him he encouraged the people he rallied the people he spoke to them it was a big ask he asked them to move from babylon to uh, jerusalem but it was a big ask why because the people they had to leave family they had to leave the friends they had to leave probably well paying jobs many of them were being into business and and they had to leave this and then go back to a place when they're not sure how, you know what is the condition of the place we know that the temples were destroyed but we don't know this is, great things happen when people respond to the call of god great things happen when people respond to the call of god this is what dl moody said he said the world is yet to see what god can do with a man fully consecrated to him and he said by god's help i will be that man when families are faithful in putting god first in his kingdom more often it has an impact on the next generation i just love it and i'll read that again when families are faithful in putting god first in his kingdom more often or not it has an impact on the next generation a husband and a wife who walked by faith and left a legacy far beyond anything they could have imagined they lived in the early 1700s their name was jonathan and sarah edwards jonathan edwards pastored a small church he wrote a few books sermons prayers but he was also influential in big in the great awakening they had 11 children i think rice was cheap at that time a study was done in the 1900s by a e winship of about 1400 edwards yeah and uh, this is what he has to say listen to this very carefully like keep in mind i said when the family serves it has an impact on the next generation next generation next generation listen to this this is what the survey said 100 lawyers and a dean of law school 80 holders in public office 66 physicians and a dean of medical school 65 professors of college and universities 30 judges 13 college presidents three mayors of large cities three governors of states three united states senators one controller of united states treasury one vice president of the united states what a legacy that he left behind it far you know impacted the next generation next generation next generation here's the question what legacy will you leave will it be a spiritual legacy or will it be a material legacy you know we'd love to leave things for our children whether it's houses money cars and all those are good things and i think we need to prepare and plan for it but will we leave them a spiritual legacy that will have an impact on the next generation and next generation and far it will touch the city and change the very uh, climate of the city or impact the city do you want to hear what what when when person leaves a bad legacy you want to hear what happens well there's research also on that and the research has been done and it and how much it cost the state but i'll leave that for another another message here's my second point it says that in verse 15 to 20 let's read that verse 15 to 20 As I said I assembled there at the canal that flows toward Ahav and we camped there 3 days 
when I checked among the people and the priests, I found no Levites there. So then I called Eliezer. So he called one of the men and said, go back and find the Levites. So when you read that passage, I found no Levites, the question that we need to ask ourselves, why did he not find Levites? Because in Ezra chapter 2, we find more than 4,000 priests decide to move back. But among those 4,000 priests, there are only 74 Levites who decide to go back. That's in Ezra chapter 2. Now we find there is no Levites, and we need to ask the question, what happened? Where are the Levites? Now keep in mind, the Levites were serving the priest. They did very menial, ordinary jobs. In Babylon, there's no temple, so there's no worship. They don't have a job. So what do they do? They look out for new jobs. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that they had got good jobs. Because they were hardworking. Wherever they go, they, they are able to create industry. They are able to create business. And they would have got good jobs, a good standing in society. And now to leave everything, to leave family, to leave the country, uh, leave their job, the status in society, and go back to a, a destroyed temple and serve doing menial job, I think they didn't find it very encouraging. There was no incentive to do that. You know, and as I was reading it, I was reminded of, of another, uh, another priest who was serving. You know, uh, I think uh, Audrey spoke about, or was it Fuzi spoke about the COVID that happened last, uh, you know, and all the impact it has. Yeah, that's true. Two full years of COVID, job loss, re salary reduction, people got hit with COVID themselves. People have lost family, loved ones. And you begin to wonder, where is God in all this? It seems like we are in exile. You know, we ourselves are in a kind of hopeless situation. And we wonder, where is God in all this? Sometimes we start to lose the passion we once had. And as I was reading this, I was reminded of Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, it's talking about a priest and his wife. The ver in verse 6 says, both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and decrees blamelessly, but they were childless because Elizabeth could not conceive, and they were both old in age. You know who I'm talking about? I'm talking about Zechariah, a, a faithful priest. This, this couple were faithful observing all the Lord's commandments. And the Bible says in uh, uh, Luke chapter 1, it was his turn to go into the temple to offer the sacrifice. When he came there, an angel came and stood beside him and said, Zachariah, your prayer has been heard. Prayer, I mean, as a young, as a young man, when they got married, they'd been waiting for their first child, waiting, 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 one year, two years, five years, 10 years, 15, I don't know, they were 20 years, and suddenly probably they gave hope, gave up hope. Because even Elizabeth, it says, she was from the line of Aaron. And the Bible says that Aaron's seed will not be barren. And so in the, old, in the ancient times, if you didn't have children, it's either you were some sin in your life. That's why you didn't have children. And here... The Bible, in the book of Proverbs, says hope deferred can make the heart sick. What does it mean? As you wait, and as you wait, and as you wait for the promise of God that you're being holding on, you think, well, God's not heard my prayers. God can't answer. Yeah, that small things God can answer, but big things God can't answer. Where is God in all this? And here's Zechariah, a faithful man of God. His wife is also faithful, observing everything. He's in the temple worshiping, offering sacrifice. And the angel comes and stands beside him and says, Zachariah, your prayer has been answered. You're going to have a son. He is going to be great in the sight of God. He is going to uh, prepare the people that day. He's going to bring back the people back to God. He's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the children to the heart of the fathers. He is going to make a people ready for the Lord. What was his answer? You will think he's excited, said, yes, it's going to happen. 
He said, how can this be? How can it be? Yeah, he touched the angel. And the angel said, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. And because you didn't believe the word, you will not be able to speak. What happened to him? Did hope deferred made the heart sick? Or did he lose his passion for God? That something in his heart, that faith was not stirred up when he heard the angel declaring the most powerful promises. It can happen to us as well. It can happen to us. As we, we come to church, we serve, but in the last two years it's been so difficult, the joy that we once had, something sucks the life out of us. Out of us. And then, yeah, we come, we read the Bible, we pray, we sing the songs, but something is lacking in our heart. And thank God for the songs that we sang today. God is setting us free. I really believe in my heart. You know, when we worship God, God just prepares the soil of our heart. He prepares the soil. God is doing something in our heart. May God just stir up our heart, stir up our heart that we come out of this bar barrenness. And there are principles within the word of God. Ezra knew the hand of God was upon him. So he sent the people, said, bring the Levites, call the Levites. And thank God they respond again. They come. Here's the principle. It is Jesus that brings us out of exile and into a relationship with God. Yeah? That's the whole thing. Why did Ezra want the people back? Why did he want the, 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 Lev the Levites? There were already Levites there. There were already priests there. Now he's going to bring reformation. The temple is already built. But now he wants to bring revival and reformation. He wants to prepare the hearts of the people. That's why he's bringing back people who can teach, again, the people of God, the ways of God. And may God stir in our hearts today something that, you know, that we come alive spiritually with the things of God, that we are passionate with the things of God. It is Jesus that brings us out of our exile out of the barrenness, out of the hopelessness. It is, he brings us out and brings us into a relationship with the living God. That's what, in the, in the temple, they knew they were waiting to come. They would come to worship. They would come to sacrifice. When they sacrificed, they knew the sins are forgiven. They are back into a relationship with God. For us, in the New Testament, Jesus paid it all. At the cross, he paid it all. He Old is gone. The new has come. Once we were far away from God, now we are brought near to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the Father we have brought. We have come into a living relationship with God. He's brought us out. He's brought us out of death into life. He's put a destiny within our heart. It's all happened. He's brought us out of exile into a relationship with, with God. Which leads me to my next point. Ezra trusted in God. In today's world, we have most of what we need. At the touch of a button, we get what we need. Here's a question. When is the last time you found yourself trusting in God? When is the last time you found yourself really trusting God? If you don't come through, you know I'm going to sink. All hope is lost. When is the last time? Trust can come immediately, but it grows over time. Faith can come immediately, but it grows over time. Let me give you a simple example. You're, going, you're waiting for a bus. I've been taking the bus recently uh, you know, to places. So I go on, the, on Google Maps to check what time the bus comes. So I go 15 minutes early because I don't want to miss the bus. But then... The next day, I just go five minutes early. Why? Because I know the bus is going to come on time. So th thereafter, I go just five minutes early. Why? I trust the bus will come on time. My, because this, my faith is increasing over time. And the same thing. Sometimes you trust, but then as something happens, it happens over and over time, your, your trust grows. It's the same thing with faith. The last two years, the last year was challenging. For, for both of us, for Pixie, for myself, for the children, it was difficult. And I found myself challenged in that area, especially of trust and in faith. Almost three times, 
in June 2021, when Pixie went to operation, almost lost her life. I said, God, if you don't come through, all hope is gone. You know, if you ask me, did you have faith? Yes, I had a lot of faith before that. But now I'm desperate. God, I'm praying, I'm waiting. People were sending scripture verses, promise. I'm holding on to those promises. I said, God, if you don't come through, all hope is gone. And then when we got COVID, you know, it's not the mild one, it's the previous one. You know, and I was cheating a little bit because, you know, we had to take out the, uh, the breath to see how, how often the good is, the oximeter. And I was cheating a bit, uh, you know, but otherwise they would admit me in the hospital. I was saying, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. You're supposed to send it to the doctor every day. You take an image of that uh, oximeter and send it. But I didn't want to be admitted in, ho in a hospital. I said, God, come through. Please come through. Otherwise, you know, all hope is gone. And then... Last year, in the last when Pixie had a heart attack, again, trusting God, God, we need you, God. Ezra trusted in God. Verse 21 to verse 23, they were taking now a lot of gold. They were taking probably three tons of gold, 15 tons of silver, precious metal. They're taking all this back to God, to, to Jerusalem. The king asked, he tells the king, we don't need soldiers. We don't. Our God is able to deliver us. Our God is able to protect us. And we will go. This is when, if you read Nehemiah, Nehemiah asked for soldiers. And that's absolutely okay. But here, Ezra trusted in God. And, and his actions proved it. And that's why I asked, when is the last time you found yourself trusting in God? Because sometimes we say, I trust God. But when things happen, then do we try to work out our own solutions? Trusting God wholly that God will come through. Without God, I cannot do it. So he says, we don't need it. They fasted, they prayed, and then it says, God took us safely. Because there were bandits, there were thieves in that time who would steal you and rob you of everything that you had. But he trusted God. And then in, in, in verse 23, it says that we came safely. Everything was, came through safely. Ezra demonstrated that through his lifestyle, he trusted God. Let, um, you know, I spoke about when families serve God, it impacts the next generation. And some of you here, I'm, I'm aware, sometimes you're realizing, but what about my, my children? What about, they've not yet come. Listen, when we read Ezra, the very first chapter and the very first few verses, it says, God moved the heart of Cyrus. Keep in mind, Cyrus was, was not a believer. He didn't know God. He was 900 miles away from Jerusalem. The, the journey, I'm told, takes four months. He was nowhere near Jerusalem, but God moved the heart of Cyrus that he made a decree and said, all those who want to go back can go back. God can move hearts of men and women, young and old. And then it continues, and then it says, God moved the hearts of the people, and so they responded to go back. It's only God. Only God can move. Do not give up hope. Do not give up. God can move their hearts. Sometimes it takes a few years, some takes four years. But like Ezra, may you have trust and faith in God that God one day will bring them, that they will serve God. And, like, and I, as I mentioned before, there were 13 families recorded. 11 were already mentioned in, in Ezra chapter 2. That means two were not mentioned. What does it mean? It means they were first generation believers, like many of us. I would say I'm a first generation believer because my parents, uh, my mom later came, but her parents, we don't know. We don't know if they were, were Christians. We just don't know. So I would say we are first generation believers. And then, but then we leave a legacy for others to follow. follow. So if you're a first generation believer, thank God somebody came through your life. Somebody met you, spoke to you. You heard the call of God. You responded. Have faith to believe that you will leave a legacy for your children and grandchildren as, and children yet to be born. That's what the psalm, psalm says. 
children yet to be born that we will have an impact like Jonathan Edwards, John and Sarah Edwards. They didn't know that they were going to have a huge impact on the next generation for the generations. May we have an impact on the next generation. Yeah. Which leads me to my fourth point. Uh, the band can come up as they come up and prepare, but I'll continue with my fourth point. The fourth point is treasures and talents. And that's found in verse 24 uh, to 29, and it ends in verse 34. There was gold, there was silver, there was precious metal. Like I said, there were tons of it. In today's, in today's estimate, it could be probably millions, 15 to 20 million dollars worth of treasure that they were taking. So what does Esau do? He gets the priest, faithful men of God. He gets them, he entrusts this treasure to them and says, guard it, that when you go back to Jerusalem, that is accounted for and handed over to the temple. The men were faithful because in verse 34 it says that they came, they handed back to the temple and everything was accounted for. And when I, when I read this, I'm reminded of Matthew chapter 20, 25. It's talking about the talents. Jesus spoke about the, the parable of the talents. So the owner calls three, three men and, he's, and he entrusts talents. First is five bags of gold. The second is three bags. And the last is one bag. Here's again another principle. When the master entrusts them, the first two, it says, immediately they went back, immediately they went ahead and put the talents to use. You, uh, Brian, you can come. Immediately they put their talents to use. So the first one, five, he doubled it. Yeah, he was a good businessman. He doubled it five to ten. The second one, the three bags of gold, he also doubled it from three to six. He was a good businessman. The third, keep in mind the Bible says the owner entrusted them each according to their ability. That means everyone had the ability to make their investment grow. Everyone had it. Yeah? Like you're sitting here, you think, well, I don't have a gift. Well, you, at least, you have at least one gift. Some have more than one gift, but you have at least one gift. God has given you a gift. The last person took the talent. He was afraid of the master. He said, my master is very harsh. He will, he will reap where he does not sow. He buried the talent. And when he came back, he said, here, the talent you gave me, here is to take it back, one talent. What did the master say? So, you know, wicked servant, you knew I was like this. Why didn't you at least put it in the bank and you would earn an interest? I said, take what belongs to him and give it to the others. May we be faithful stewards of all that God has given us. God has given us talents. May we be faithful to use, to serve, that we might be a blessing to others. That's why God gives us these talents so that we might serve the church, serve the community, and serve one another. May we be a blessing. Let, let's rise. I'll pray and then we'll hand it over to the band. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, it is you who calls us. It is you who calls out of exile into a relationship with you. It's you who calls out of barrenness into freedom, that we are free to run, we are free to dance, we are free to live. Lord, may we live for you. May we live for you, Lord Jesus. May we serve you faithfully all the days of our life. And may we have a huge impact on others, but also in the next generation as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.